Um, the next scripture reading is actually Psalm 30. Uh, if you would turn to page 762, if you want the hymnal card. We're going to be doing the first response. I'm going to ask Elaine if she would let us hear what that sounds like. Seven sixty-two. As an English major, it should say, "For the night, comma, weeping may tarry," just so you know that it makes sense. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cry to you for help, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol. Restore me to life from among those gone down to pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Surely the Lord's anger is but for a moment. The Lord's favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you have established me as a strong mountain. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What problem is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have lost my sackcloth and girded me with gladness that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. As I mentioned earlier, it's been a difficult week in terms of getting things together. Those of you who have favorite computers and know them like the back of your hand will understand that when mine just simply quit one day, and I have no reason to figure out why, it just quit. And so I took it down to Office Depot because the techs there are supposed to be able to fix anything and they'll give you a diagnostic for free. They've now had it for five days. And I fear that the diagnosis is it's dead. <laughs> but they don't want to tell me that. So I pulled out this old gem. It has the inner workings for Word from 2003. It will not connect to my printer, which is a 2015. It will not connect to the office printer. In fact, it doesn't even see the office printer like it's supposed to. So, that's why you get this silver thing in front of my face, and I'll try to come over here every now and then. The scripture that we had today, the first scripture, the Gospel of John, is one of my favorite ones. It tells a story that helps us understand who Jesus is as the risen Lord, what he 
wants to give to us and what he wants us to then give to others. And it features dear sweet Peter, bumbling old Peter who is so human you can't help but recognize yourself in him when he speaks or acts. I like how they said he put his clothes on before he jumped into the water. We're going to look at the Gospel of John to see what it has to say about the disciples after the crucifixion. Remember, this was the third time that Jesus had appeared to them. We're going to look at what this particular scripture says about the risen Christ and what an ancient story, and it is thousands of years old, has to say to us about our lives in the here and now. These are the three things that Scripture can always give us if we know to look for them. So first of all, we look at the scene painted by John. You've heard it in the children's message and you've heard it read in Scripture. Now you're going to hear it as a love story told. As the scene opens, we find Peter and John and their friends back at their old trade fishing on the Sea of Tiberias. Given up? They have. Jesus is dead, and so they return to what they know. With typical luck, they had worked all night and caught nary a fish. But as dawn broke across the lake, they saw a man standing on shore and watching them. Catch anything, he called out. Not a thing, they replied. And then they wondered, who is this man? And then he says to them, cast your net on the other side so that we can tell um, whether or not you have been fishing in the wrong place. So they mumbled among themselves and then they said, okay, what do we have to lose? So they threw the net out on the other side. And they caught so many fish, the net was bulging so much that it was about to break and when they pulled it into the boat the boat almost capsized whoops <laughs> I thought I turned that off not even a number I recognize <laughs> back to our story they were all commenting on the number of fish the size of their catch and after they'd fished all night on one side and to just simply go to the other side of the boat and get such a catch was unusual. And then John, who always got it, said, It's the Lord. And then Peter got all excited. It's the Lord. My version says he jumped into the water and swam to meet his Lord. He was the first one there to the beach and he saw a fire where food was being cooked. And he saw a man, at first he didn't recognize who he was because Jesus' appearance was changed a little bit, but then he, he looked closer and he saw the loving heart of the man who was standing there and he knew that it was his Lord. The more practical among them brought the boat to shore with the fish. Peter didn't know what to make of what was going on. After all, this is the man who was crucified. This was the man who had said he would come back, but nobody really understood or thought that he would. And here he is on the seashore with fish cooking over a fire and bread too. And he says to the, to the others, bring some of the fish that you have caught so I can add them to what I'm cooking. And so they did. And Jesus prepared all those fish, and he put them on the fire with the others and with the bread that was cooking. And those of you who have experienced fish being cooked over an open fire, the, the smell is just amazing. When all the fish was cooked, Jesus had them sit down and then he fed them one by one. He gave them the bread and he gave them the fish. And then he joined in the meal with them. And when everybody had eaten, Jesus said to 
the disciple, the one who was the most human, the one who was always putting his foot in his mouth, he said to Peter, do you love me? Now remember, this is the same Peter that had denied Jesus three times before the crucifixion. This is the same Peter who ran away from when the crucifixion took place. This is the same Peter who was hiding in the upper room with all the others. And Jesus, without a tinge of judgment or malice, says to him, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, of course. And so Jesus says, first, feed my lambs. And while Peter was taking that in, Jesus said again, Peter, do you love me? The second time, Peter said, of course I do. You know I do. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And then the third time, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And by now, Peter's feelings are hurt, and he gets a little defensive, and he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And again, Jesus says, feed my sheep. Three responses to Peter and to the others who were hearing it, telling them to show gratitude for what they had been given by giving to others. Now, it's not that shocking a thing for us to hear, but for the disciples who had very little, even though they had been listening to Jesus preach and had heard all about how they were supposed to take care of one another and love one another and all that, they'd seen the crucifixion, they'd seen how people ran, they had seen how difficult life was going to be for them as followers of the Christ. But eventually... They did as they were asked. This scene that Jesus puts before us is Christ's invitation to all of us, not just to the disciples, to be strengthened in our faith by coming together as we do today, as spending time with Jesus in prayer, as we do, hopefully, all the time, and then to share with others. We are not in a world made to keep accumulating for ourselves, but to take what is given to us, what is gifted to us, and in gratitude, share that with others. The feed my sheep, take care of my sheep, feed my lambs, wasn't just something Jesus wanted to say because it sounded good. He meant it. He meant that that's what we are supposed to do. His love is an unconditional love. It's a love that um, gets strengthened the more it's worked within our community. And it's a, um, a love that becomes love when it's given away. Reba McIntyre, country singer, I'm not much of a country fan, but I do like Reba McIntyre, has a song that's called Love Isn't Love Until You Give It Away. And if you want to, you can find the whole thing on YouTube. It's really worth looking up and hearing the whole thing. But the title is used in the song as the refrain. One verse says, The love in your heart wasn't put there to stay. Oh, love isn't love till you give it away. Because love can't survive when it's hidden inside. And love was meant to be shared. Love isn't love until you give it away. Love isn't love till it's free. The love in your heart wasn't put there to stay. Oh, love isn't love till you give it away. When Jesus was feeding and sharing and talking with Peter and the others, he was showing them how to be in ministry. Without saying a word to them, he had showed them that they were to take care of one another, that they were to share the bounty that they had with one another. They also um, learned from Jesus that that unconditional love that he had always talked about included forgiving and knowing that God accepts us no matter what we are doing. Now, God accepts us and knows that we might need to move sometimes, but that's not up for us to do. That's for God to do. 
So, what are we supposed to do and what's our ministry supposed to look like? First of all, it's supposed to be non-judgmental and unconditional. No strings attached, forgiving and accepting, knowing that God is still at work in each one of us, ourselves included. So I thought about some of the things that have happened in the last few weeks and I wanted to share them with you so that you could see how in reality it works to share God's love with others. Bill mentioned it in prayers, a school bus overturned on York Road about a mile from Hereford High School. In fact, it had just left the high school. It had both middle and high students on it. It was scary stuff. If you saw it online or on the news, you saw a bus that was turned over at a place where with just a little bit of more movement, it would have gone over the side. Instead, it crashed into a pole and into the um, um, metal, um, yeah, whatever those things are called. <laughs> and it didn't go any further, but it could have. There were kids who were hurt, some um, badly but not uh, life-threatening, and some were just cuts and bruises, and some were just shaken up. There were two brothers on that bus, and I'm proud to say they were members of my youth group in the church that I served out in Hereford Zone. And when they looked around and saw what was happening, they were afraid the bus was going to catch on fire or fall over the edge. And so they figured out how on a bus that was dumped on its side to open the emergency door and one by one get all the kids out. And while one brother did that, the other brother started walking them down the road away from the bus in case it had caught on fire. Now, these are not extraordinary kids except that I know that they are strong um, members of the Scouts and they uh, would later tell reporters that it was their years of scouting that helped them figure out what to do and what they told their pastor was once they figured out what to do it was their faith that made them strong enough to do it. Two kids, one high school, one middle school. Those children, and they are children, will for a long time remember the experience they had in that bus and the kids who are now coming to them and saying, thank you for doing what you did, and parents who are now saying, thank you for doing what you did. The bus driver is better, but she was hurt, um, what at the time they said was critical, so pretty badly. So prayers for them. But this is a good example of how taking what you've been given, knowledge and faith, and sharing it without question with others. Love isn't love till you give it away. Then something totally different. I read a news story about a teenage girl who had been sexually abused from the age of 10 by her stepfather. She and her mother eventually turned him in, but it took three years for the case to come to court. Three whole years. In that time, she was so frightened that he would come and kill her or her mom, as he had threatened to do, that her whole life was turned upside down. She got to the place where she didn't want to go to school. She showered with her clothes on. She always was ready to run. Now, there's a group of unlikely heroes who heard about her and her story. And they showed up one day, a whole group of them, 15 or 20, on their motorcycles, dressed in their leather vests and with all their tattoos and piercings and everything else that goes along with a biker gang. They showed up at the house, and apparently the mom knew they were coming because she didn't act surprised. So those people told this girl that they were going to keep her safe, that they would take her to school, and they did, on their bikes, and they would bring her home, and they did, on their bikes, that they would uh, stand guard at the school and that they would stand guard outside her house and on each corner of uh, where she lived, each corner of the streets where she lived. And they did that until finally the stepfather came to court. The little girl was called to testify and she was terrified. And so the leader of the group to whom she had started to look for all kinds of 
um, safety, went with her to court, and the others were outside the courthouse. And when it was time for her to testify, he told her to look just at him, nowhere else, because the stepfather was there making faces trying to intimidate her. And she said exactly what she needed to say, and her stepfather was found guilty and sent to jail. The bikers stayed around a little while until they saw for sure that the little girl was not only feeling safe, but happy. And then they went on to the next case. The group is an international group, and they are known as BACA, B-A-C-A, -A, Bikers Against Child Abuse. Some of the most unlikely people who knew they had a gift that could be given to a child to make them feel safe. And so they did, even though a lot of times the world would have said they are the least likely to do it. They knew they had it, and they did it. Love isn't love until you give it away. And this one I put in here just because it's one of my favorites, and it shows that our love goes for all God's creation. In Freedom, Freeland, there is an animal rescue group who takes care of endangered, lost, or unwanted pigs. Most are adult pot bellies who got too big for the family to keep, and they either got rid of them or started looking for a place for them to go. If they went into a regular animal shelter, then they call um, Whispering Rise Farm an animal sanctuary. You can check them out on Facebook. They feed them, they clean up after them, they provide clean, dry, and warm shelters. You can see volunteers of all ages busy making life better for these pigs. We organized some farmers to make sure the pigs got lots of fresh produce because we can't give them bread because pot bellies tend to get fat real quick. And so healthy is the way to go. The volunteers know that they can do it and they give a lot of time, sometimes two or three days a week feeding and cleaning and, and young kids mucking out the areas that need to be mucked. And if you know farmers, you know that means cleaning up the stuff. Their view of love comes from hands-on experience of taking care of these pigs. And they know they can. Love isn't love until you give it away. So with those examples, I just want to say that love is not what you say. Love is what you do. I know folks that have strong convictions about life and what it is in terms of how they live and how they love. They talk about love all the time. But mostly it's a version of love that they've seen in movies, on TV, that sort of thing. It's a hallmark view. But the kind of love that Christ sends us out into the world with is one that takes hard work. It takes moving beyond our boundaries. It takes seeing others as people of Christ, whether we know them or not, whether we approve of how they live or not, whether we think they should get a job, whatever it is that we think about people. Our job is not to judge. Our job is to love. And I don't mean hug them and all that. I mean love them into feeding them, helping them find jobs, uh, doing resumes, simply smiling when you see them on the street, making eye contact, treating them like people who are created by the same God who creates us. The sticking point is that stepping out of our comfort zones. We don't really want to do that. It's too uncomfortable. Hence, we don't. But when we do, that kind of love gives more to us than it does to the people we're loving. Ask anyone who's been on a mission trip. They go with the idea they're going to help people. They come home with the idea that, oh my gosh, what a privilege it was to get to know those people and to be in ministry with them. With them, not at them. Now, we come to church because we consider ourselves good Christians. And I saw this on Facebook. And... I kind of like it. It says, going to church doesn't make anyone a Christian any more than standing in a garage makes us a car. We have to do what we were created to do. We have to fulfill the job that Christ has given to us. 
And it's different for everyone because everyone has a different kind of gift. But all of it is showing God's love. This church, I just look at the things that you do, and you do an amazing amount of things, good things, Christian things, things that God is pleased about. Some of you do it because you want to. Some of you do it because you think you have to. Some of you do it because your kids make you. Some of you do it because your parents make you. But for whatever reason, when we come to church, that giving love away really is important. Do it simply by sending a card, or more difficult, go see somebody. More than that, use your money, but use your body, your hands, and your heart, and your head to take care of folks. That's what we're supposed to do. That's why love isn't love until you give it away. To God be the glory. Amen.